there is a discrepancy between what the what the observations are showing, which shows about a an average of 0.13 degrees C per decade warming, which is you know a very small number uh, compared to the climate models, which are generally oh twice that at least. My thanks to those who cited this interview with Roy Spencer a few weeks back, claiming that global warming is far less than models predicted. Actually, he's been saying the same thing for three decades, and in this video, I'll look at that claim. So let's start with whether measurements show that the Earth's temperature is rising at 0.13 degrees centigrade per decade. The answer is yes, if we only look at Roy Spencer and John Christie's analysis of the satellite data at the University of Alabama at Huntsville, UAH. If we look at all the other temperature monitoring bodies, they all show warming of about 0.18 degrees centigrade per decade. If you think satellites are more reliable than ground stations, well, the analysis by the other satellite monitoring body, Remote Sensing Systems, that's the purple line at the top, also shows warming of about 0.18 degrees centigrade per decade. Radioson balloons, which, like the satellites, are measuring temperatures in the lower troposphere, show even higher rates of warming. And an average of all the tropospheric measurements, including Spencer's UAH analysis, gives a warming trend of, again, 0.18 degrees centigrade per decade and the temperature trend conforms pretty well to the predictions of the models. Several independent studies have been done, and they found a close match. The most recent study, a 2020 analysis in geophysical research letters, found that 14 out of 17 models closely matched observations for a given concentration of CO2. For a more detailed explanation of their results, please see the video description with a link to the study, all my sources are listed in the video description, along with links. A couple of the models reviewed are more than twice the temperature trend Spencer calculated, which would be over 0.26 degrees centigrade per decade, but there's also one that's way under. So it's very easy to cherry-pick. But the fact is that most of the models match the actual trend shown by every temperature data set except Spencer's. So the next question is, how reliable is Spencer's analysis? The advantage to it is that it's from satellites and it covers the whole Earth. There's no other uh, temperature data set that covers the whole Earth. Actually, there is. There's the analysis by Remote Sensing Systems, which also gets its data from the same satellite and covers the whole Earth. As we've seen, their results don't agree with Spencer's. They agree much more closely with all the other temperature measurements. OK, then, maybe Spencer and his colleague, John Christie, have a much better track record than anyone else in getting their temperature analysis right. And that's why we should only trust their results and ignore all the others. In fact, the opposite is true. In the 1990s, their temperature data set was again out of sync with all the others. Spencer claimed their satellite measurements, the line at the bottom with the black dots, showed not a warming but a cooling trend of about 0.1 degrees centigrade per decade in the tropics. The graph they published showed the ground temperature data on the top line with a clear warming trend. When two researchers published evidence in 1997 that Spencer and Christie's observations must be wrong, Spencer said there isn't a problem with the measurements that we can find. And in a speech to the Competitive Enterprise Institute in 1997, he argued that his results have an independent validation, which, he said, surface measurements don't. As now, Spencer used his observations to argue that the warming predictions were wrong. He said the models had originally predicted warming of around 0.3 degrees centigrade per decade, but had now reduced that to 0.18 degrees. If that figure sounds familiar, we saw earlier that that's not only the prediction of the models for actual CO2 concentration, it's also the amount of warming measured by RSS and all the ground stations. Spencer didn't disagree that CO2 is a greenhouse gas, but he argued that since the troposphere wasn't warming as expected, then nature must be getting rid of the excess heat, a temperature stabilising mechanism. It wasn't until 2005 that researchers at the other Satellite Analysis Institute, RSS, finally discovered the error in Spencer and Christie's calculations. 
Put simply, the orbit of the temperature-measuring satellite degrades over time. As a result, daily temperatures get taken later and later in the day, which gives a false lower reading. Spencer and Christie had adjusted their data to take account of this, but they'd made a mathematical error. When the error was corrected, their temperature readings went from a flat line of 0.087 to 0.19 degrees centigrade per decade, in line with everyone else. And in line with the models, which Spencer himself had said predicted warming of around 0.18 degrees centigrade per decade. Spencer later argued on his blog that this was only one error in 25-plus years. Actually, there were others, but this was the most egregious, and it was a hugely important error because the ambiguity set climate science back a decade. And it was one of the first claims that launched the so-called sceptic movement on social media. Now it was clear that the world was indeed warming, Spencer had to drop the argument that weather systems were ridding the world of the excess heat caused by rising CO2 levels, because clearly they weren't. But he still didn't want to drop his belief that the Earth must have some kind of natural self-regulating mechanism that would somehow stop the warming. That idea doesn't work if carbon dioxide is responsible, because it would mean that temperatures would keep going up as long as we keep adding CO2 to the atmosphere. So he started looking around for some other reason for the warming. In 2008, he told a Heritage Foundation conference, there's probably a natural reason for it. In a blog contribution that same year, he predicted that further research will reveal some other cause, maybe the sun or a change in cloudiness, perhaps due to changes in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. But further research didn't show that. Solar physicists showed that solar activity was falling, so the sun couldn't be pushing global temperatures up. And further research showed that for over a hundred years, there was no trend in the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, compared to the upward trend in global temperature. As for clouds, Spencer's argument was that they're nature's sunshade, so if there's a decrease in cloud cover, you get warming. How could the experts have missed such a simple explanation, he asked. Well, they hadn't. Experts had done a huge amount of research into the cooling effect of clouds. What they didn't miss was the fact that as well as being nature's sunshade, clouds are also nature's blanket. They reflect shortwave energy from the sun back into space on top, but also trap longwave radiation, heat energy, on Earth from below. What studies found was that the warming effect is much more pronounced on high-altitude clouds at night and at higher latitudes, and the cooling effect is greater with low-altitude clouds during the day closer to the tropics. Looking at both of these effects, and not just one, the net effect of an increase in cloud cover is zero to slightly positive. So if anything, studies show a decrease in cloud cover would cause a very slight cooling, not warming. Is Spencer's belief that there's probably a natural reason for global warming and his feeling that the Earth has a natural air conditioning process sounds like an article of faith, well, there's a good reason for that. Spencer has made no secret of his belief that God is directing the climate. He's a member and also on the advisory board of an evangelical organization called the Cornwall Alliance that believes the Earth and its ecosystems, created by God's intelligent design and infinite power and sustained by his faithful providence, are robust, resilient, self-regulating and self-correcting. Earth's climate system is no exception. Now, there's nothing wrong with personal religious belief, and millions of scientists around the world are Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists and Muslims who believe in all kinds of deities. That's not the issue. The problem arises when a widely accepted scientific conclusion is specifically precluded by that religious belief. When Spencer expounds his ideas of some unknown self-regulating system keeping global warming in check, in speeches, letters to politicians, blogs and TV interviews, people assume he's talking as a scientist. They may not be aware that what he's saying is indistinguishable from his religious doctrine that there must be a self-regulating system, because God would never let the climate warm beyond a comfortable level.' 
It's very clear to geologists, and this is my field, that the Earth does not have a self-regulating system that keeps temperatures stable because they've gone much higher and lower in the past. A million years ago, there was a glaciation called the Calabrian, with ice sheets across most of the continents. 50 million years ago, there was what's called a hothouse or greenhouse period in the late Cretaceous. And before that, a cool period. And before that, another greenhouse. And before that, an ice age. And before that, a greenhouse. And before that, an ice age. And before that, 500 million years ago, there was another greenhouse with coral reefs near the North Pole. The range in temperatures between these extremes is around 13 degrees centigrade. If you want to see why these changes have occurred, see my video, The History of the Earth in 33 Minutes. But even if you don't accept the scientific explanation for these changes, the idea that there's a self-regulating mechanism, or that God or a force of nature would never let temperatures rise above 1 or 2 degrees centigrade, is clearly not supported by evidence from the past unless you believe the Earth's geological history only goes back 6,500 years. But back to more recent history. No sooner had Spencer and Christie's UAH satellite analysis been corrected than RSS had its own problems with satellite data. Just like UAH in the 1990s, while every other data set showed warming, RSS showed none, or even a slight cooling. Of course, it was pretty obvious to climatologists that there was something wrong with RSS's analysis. In his blog, Spencer wrote that even his boss, John Christie, thought that the temperature recorded by RSS data was undergoing spurious cooling. In other words, it's wrong, most likely caused, again, by a decaying satellite orbit. And Spencer added that those of you who really, really need the global temperature record to show as little warming as possible might want to consider jumping ship and switch from the UAH to the RSS data set. I'm sure it was meant as a joke, but that's exactly what they did. Now that UAH had admitted the world was indeed warming and it was the RSS data that flatlined, suddenly it was the RSS data set that was brought out every time the critics wanted to prove that global warming had stopped. There's been no significant warming whatsoever. The satellites show no global warming at all. Well, one analysis of the satellite data showed no warming. The other satellite data analysis, by John Christie and Roy Spencer, did show warming. Same with all the ground temperature data over the same period. The same cherry-picked RSS graph was passed around blogs held up in congressional committee hearings, featured in political reports, shown on TV, and wheeled out during political conferences, until finally, in 2017, RSS found and published the source of its error. As Christie and the other experts had predicted, when the faults were corrected, RSS data showed a warming trend that matched the warming trend measured by everyone else and it showed warming of around, guess what, 0.18 degrees centigrade per decade for the last 35 years. So why does satellite analysis, once lauded as the best data available, keep giving wrong numbers? The problem is there's just one satellite gathering data, and it isn't simply pointing thermometers at the atmosphere and taking the temperature. The process is far more complicated than that. It measures microwave radiance from oxygen atoms, and from that, researchers calculate the energy of the atoms. And from that energy, they calculate the temperature of the atoms in that part of the troposphere using a model called the retrieval algorithm. Then UAH subtracts what they estimate is the radiative effect from the ground. Finally, they have to calculate the position of the satellite and adjust the data to take account of its changing orbit. Spencer and Christie developed this model back in the 1980s, and it was certainly a brilliant method of measuring the temperature of the lower troposphere, in theory. But in practice, it's complicated and flawed, and frequently underestimates global temperature trends. If any conspiracy theorists think that this is just a plot by scientists to change data they don't like, I should point out that Spencer and Christie themselves have published corrections in 1992, 1994, 97, 98, 2003 and 2004. 
Each time they made a correction, it adjusted the actual tropospheric temperature higher. They also accepted the major error found by RSS in 2005, and they accepted the revision RSS made to its own faulty data in 2017. So given the track record of satellite analysis, it's not a huge surprise that UAH temperature measurements have again been drifting below all the others. That's why it's misleading to report this as the actual temperature trend, which shows about a, an average of 0.13 degrees C per decade warming, and ignore all the others. Apart from his belief that there should be a negative feedback system to counteract global warming, Spencer's other argument is, or rather was, that the main positive feedback anticipated by researchers wouldn't happen. That's an increase in water vapour. The models predict that as more CO2 is added to the atmosphere, the amount of water vapour in the atmosphere increases because there's more evaporation and warmer air can hold more water vapour. Since water vapour is a powerful greenhouse gas, that amplifies the warming. Back in 1997, Spencer didn't disagree that water vapour is a powerful greenhouse gas and any increase could produce positive feedback. He just didn't think such an increase would happen. But his prediction was wrong. Studies measuring water vapour in the atmosphere over the next 20 years did find a change, an increase, just as the models had predicted. This wasn't the only prediction Spencer's got wrong over the years. Also in 1997, he expressed little confidence we'd even see 1 to 1.5 degrees of warming by the end of this century. But we've already seen a 1 degree centigrade rise in line with the models, and it's only 2022. In 2012, he predicted this. We may see very little warming in the future. That prediction was also wrong. Even Spencer's own data showed continued warming, just as the models had predicted. And, as he admitted on his blog, all of the next six years were warmer than 2012, and four of them were the warmest ever recorded. As more and more of his predictions failed, and increasingly the warming we're seeing matched the predictions of the models, it became harder for Spencer to claim there was no warming or that CO2 wasn't the cause. So his position has shifted over the last 25 years. Regarding tropospheric temperatures, he moved from claiming there's a cooling trend and it's unlikely temperatures will increase even 1 to 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of this century, to an admission that it was actually warming faster than that, and then to a claim that we'd see no more warming, and then to an admission that there was more warming, and last year, an assertion that warming will reach 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade when CO2 concentration doubles late in the 21st century. As for carbon dioxide, in the 1990s he argued that it wasn't causing any warming because nature was getting rid of the excess heat. In 2008, after his temperature measurements were shown to be wrong, he said the warming was nothing to do with CO2. Four years later, he said this. I think that uh, most of the warming we've seen could well be natural. Or to put it another way. I think some of that warmth is due to the CO2 we're producing. And a few seconds later, it goes up to half. I think about half of it's natural. A year later in his blog, he changed that to could be mostly human caused. So over the last 25 years, Spencer's temperature predictions have slowly risen from negligible warming to almost match published estimates. And his view about the role of carbon dioxide in this warming have moved up from none to some to half to most. Despite doing numerous TV and vlog interviews, no one seems to have noticed this subtle shift in position over the last 25 years or asked Spencer about it. So this brings us back to where we started. Far from failing, the climate models have proved to be remarkably accurate, while Spencer's predictions pretty much all failed. Spencer has had to change his position several times to keep up, and has moved closer and closer to the published science. So will he take that extra last step? My prediction is that he can't. If he accepts that the increase in CO2 concentration is responsible for recent warming, that would go against his fundamental religious belief that God is in charge of the climate. And if he accepts that a doubling of CO2 concentration will lead to a rise of around 3 degrees centigrade, 
and keep rising as we burn more fossil fuels, then his doctrine that God has given the earth a self-regulating climate is dead. Abandoning a scientific conclusion in the face of overwhelming contrary evidence is easy. Abandoning a fundamental religious belief seems to be much, much harder.